Hi, I'm Ali Jackson Jolly. I'm here with Emre Pecker. He is with Eurasia Group, and he is here to talk with us about the um, elections in Istanbul, Turkey last week. Emre, welcome, and thanks for being here with us. Thank you for having me, Ali. Yeah, so last week's elections in Istanbul, Turkey have been called a major blow to the Erdogan regime administration. Um, what should we know about those elections that happened last week? And um, do you agree that this was a big blow to the current administration? Sure. Um, let's start on your final point. Uh, is this a big blow to President Erdogan and his ruling AKP? Absolutely. This is the worst election performance uh, of the AKP since it came to power in 2002. It came in second, which is unprecedented, to the main opposition party known by its Turkish initial CHP, which swept across municipal elections to win 35 of the 81 races. And all told, the opposition camp now controls a majority of the cities in Turkey. So this is a huge setback uh, for uh, President Erdogan, and he will be certainly reeling from it. Um, in in terms of uh, what this means going forward and, uh, and uh, how big a blow it is, um, this is not the end all be all for the president by any means. Uh, it's very, uh, Erdogan is a very sort of uh, adaptable, politician who has persevered over many crises, uh, but it definitely makes life a lot more difficult for him. Yeah, and I was, I'm was i glad you brought that up. I was going to ask that. He has been in power since 2003. I believe he was the prime minister first and then the president. Um, he has obviously, as you mentioned, um, outlived a lot of oppositions and, you know, dealt with a lot of... Um, adversaries um, and has seemed to always sort of um, overcome. Um, so the fact that, you know, the news that we're reading, uh, political commentators are sort of indicating this may be his swan song um, makes me ask, why do you think this time is a little different than some of those other um, sticky situations that he's navigated through. Yeah, I think, I mean, never write off Erdogan. That's rule number one of Turkish politics. So I'd be cautious about saying this is uh, this is it for the president uh, because he's managed to bounce back uh, numerous times. Um, what is different this time is that there is an upswell in opposition, and this is primarily driven by the state of the economy and a cost of living crisis that voters have started feeling uh, since Erdogan won re-election uh, as president and maintained his parliamentary majority in the May 2023 national elections. Uh, ever since that, uh, even though uh, for the trend eye and on paper, the situation was worse uh, in the lead up to last year's elections and a crisis was maybe more imminent. And now Turkey is on a better macroeconomic footing than it was prior to last year's election. For the man on the street, for the SMEs, the situation has deteriorated massively. And what we've seen at the elections is a huge rejection of Erdogan's governance at the national level, which the voters demonstrated by voting for the opposition at the municipal polls. Um, now, why not write off Erdogan now? And why is this maybe not quite a swan song? Uh, he has four years with no elections until 2028. Uh, if his economy czar, uh, treasury and finance minister Mehmet Şimşek has his way and things go according to plan, then from 2026 onwards, and this is a long time granted, the economy should be in a recovery mode. And and if, if that recovery uh, continues unabated, then heading into the next elections, Adam will be in a much better position. 
This long period also provides a lot of opportunities for Erdogan to use his incumbency powers and state uh, the uh, the state apparatus to go after his opponents and dissent as he has in the past by discrediting them, by strapping them of resources and by trying to sideline them. So it's a, it, you know, the opposition has just managed to overtake barely Erdogan's AKP. Now they need to continue to build on that. And national elections versus local elections are two separate things. Uh, voters don't feel as confident changing horses uh, at the national level as they do at the local level. But if the opposition can prove that they can govern and they can embrace all segments of society, particularly Islamists and conservatives that form the base of Erdogan, uh, then they will have a real shot at removing him from power in 2028. So I think I would not say this is the end for Erdogan, but I would say for Erdogan, staying in power has just become significantly more difficult and moreover, the hardest ever uh, during his two decade rule. Yeah, and you mentioned um, the econ economy of Turkey. And so I wanted to ask you, what do you think, if you could look in your crystal ball, what do you think this means for how the president will um, change or tweak his economic policies? As you mentioned, um, the people of Turkey are really feeling the pinch of the economy. Um, economic levers take a while, as you also um, mentioned, to start to turn. So um, it, it, nothing is going to happen instantaneously. But if you were to guess, what do you think the president may do to change his economic policies? Or will he not change anything and just hope that things just get better in time? Well, the, the thing for him to do right now would be not to touch anything, because what he did after he was reelected last May was to do away with his uh, previous unorthodox beliefs, although those might still be dear to his heart. At least in practice, he brought back his former finance minister back into government. He let uh, Mr. Shimshek put together a very credible and good team. Uh, they picked a strong central bank governor uh, and, you know, they replaced one, but still there is continuity. And in the end, uh, they, the new economy management started administrating uh, the policies uh, to rebalance Turkey's economy, to reduce its external financing weaknesses and to combat inflation back in June of last year. Now, that process is going to, inflation is heading towards 75%. Uh, so this process obviously is going to take a long time. So what Adon needs to do is allow the economy team the room to maneuver and hike interest rates as needed and curb domestic demand as needed uh, in their efforts to rebalance the economy, uh, reduce demand and bring down inflation. So all he needs to do is be patient. And that's where the big question mark is. Does Erdogan have the stomach to uh, for very low levels of growth or for potentially even a recession to tame inflation and put Turkey on a more sustainable, solid economic footing? Uh, again, uh, one and a half to three years down the road. Um, that's That's the big question. For now, uh, our anticipation is that he will stay the course. But now that he has suffered such a massive setback at the local elections, he will pressure his finance minister, Mr. Shimshek, some more to show results. And if Shimshek can show results, the anticipation is that inflation will start slowing down rapidly in the second half of this year. If that does not materialize, then I think we're looking at an iffy scenario. Okay, and um, zooming out a little bit, looking at uh, Turkey's neighbors and some of the, you know, um, Western nations and the U.S., like, what are Turkey's neighbors thinking about this change of regime, at least in Istanbul? What are, you know, what are, how are they going to perhaps tweak um, what they're thinking about um, in, in the way that they're interacting with Turkey or just the way they're watching 
um, how this turning point, you know, plays out. Well, I think in the way that uh, international actors position themselves vis-a-vis -vis Turkey, not much is going to change because um, for starters, in Turkey's three biggest cities, the opposition had already wrested control from Erdogan back in the 2019 local elections. So what they did was secure re-election by wider and uh, wider margins and in more uh, cities. Uh, but at the national level, Adan still has a parliamentary majority and he's still sitting atop a very strong executive presidency. Uh, his nationalist allies in parliament are supportive of his policy agenda. So put when you put all of these together, then uh, for Adan's counterparts in Europe, in the US, in the Middle East, uh, the address is still the president. Uh, and four years is a long time. It's not like there are national elections a year from now, in which case maybe there would be a bit more uncertainty. Maybe other foreign actors would want to see, uh, you know, disengage from Erdogan and see who wins the next elections. But for the next four years or the good part of the next four years, I think they will treat Erdogan, uh, you know, as the head of state and as their uh, counterpart. The, and it's an important year, uh, beginning like this month already, Adan is probably going to visit Iraq uh, for his first state visit in over a decade. Uh, at the beginning of May, he's expected in Washington for his first state visit to President Biden uh, since he took office. Uh, then he will be at the NATO summit uh, over the summer. Uh, so there's much to do on the international agenda. Uh, and Turkey is at the intersection of a lot of uh, important developments from the Ukraine war to the Israel-Hamas war uh, and broader crises uh, from the Caucasus to Libya. So uh, disengaging with Erdogan is not really an option for other leaders. Yeah, and he mentioned that he thought this would be his last term. Um, in the U.S., we start talking about um, sitting duck presidents, but Everything you just mentioned did not sound like a, he's acting like a sitting duck president. He still sounds like he is creating a leadership role for himself in international and national politics. Um, do you think he really is going to go quietly into the night after this term is over? Or what, what do you think? Uh, well, no strong Turkish leader has ever retired. Since the foundation of the republic in 1923 onwards, uh, you, you can list at least uh, half a dozen who have been very influential and they've all stuck around for decades, some until they died. So I don't think Erdogan's only 70 years old. Uh, he has a massive legacy uh, and we call this his worst performance, but he's still getting a third of all the votes nationally. Uh, so the problem for him is, is that he's well short of the simple majority of 50% plus one that he needs to be re-elected president. He's at the end of his term limits constitutionally, uh, so he can't stand for re-election unless parliament triggers early elections, but he doesn't have a qualified majority to force the parliament to do that and stand for another term. So what he needs to be able to remain in power is either uh, a giveaway to the opposition in parliament to trigger snap elections uh, in a few years time, uh, which I don't think the opposition would have any incentive to do, uh, or find a way to amend the constitution so he can overcome term limits. Uh, both of those scenarios look very unlikely at the moment. But again, four years is a long time. When the economic recovery is in place, Erdogan will surely look to maneuver and see if he can pick off opposition lawmakers to join his camp, to support an amendment or to support an early election. Um, and, uh, and if those don't pan out, I think he will groom, try to groom a successor uh, who would run on his ticket and he would remain the AKP's chairman so in effect, uh, it, it, he would not be 
uh, de jure in power, but de facto, you would still be pulling the strings. Yeah, wow. So we're out of time. Um, I really appreciate you being here, making us smarter about these really complex issues in Turkey. Um, and from what you say, the key is to watch the economy, to see what happens with inflation in the next half a year to a year. So we'd definitely love to have you back when that economic engine starts to either rev up or rev down whichever way and um, hear what you have to say in a few months from now. Yep. Have to rejoin anytime. Thank you for having me, Alan. Thanks so much for being here.